good morning. Good morning. Well, okay, can I just tell you how, well, I have really static in this morning, how impressed I am. It is really slick out today, how impressed I am that you are all here this morning. So give yourselves a little pat on the back this morning for, for being here. And okay, so the big thing is too, Doug Welch was out here this morning with the scraper, scraping off the ice. And so I, 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 Doug, I don't think he's in the room right now. Doug is awesome. So uh, Board of Property Management, is anybody else who is out there scraping this morning or putting ice melts? We have now used up all of the ice melt, Bill told me. So that's, we've done what we can. We have no, there is no more ice melt left. That's right. <laughs> that, that's right. Hopefully that's the end of the, end of, end of the ice. As we begin our time together this morning, in each one of our pews, we have our pew pads. So give yourself credit for being here today by placing your name in that and passing that down to whoever may be next to you. Also, if there's a prayer that you'd like to share with our entire church community, please fill out one of the prayer cards that's in your pew and then place that in the offering plate later in the service. Good morning. There's a lot going on in the life of our church, as there always is, but a few things I'd like to draw your attention to. Coming up on February 21st, we have an opportunity to be in a ministry of service to some of the women in our community who have been affected by domestic violence. One of the long-standing ministries of Colonial is called Molly's Table, and that is, the name is growing, Molly's Table and Marilyn's Meal. And so we are looking for volunteers who would like to participate on that night. If that that's something that you would like to participate in. Jenny Cosgrove is the coordinator. She is standing in the foyer. So when she comes through that door, I point her out. Here she is. Jenny Cosgrove is the coordinator. <laughs> and so if you would like to be part of that extraordinary event, please let Jenny know. Also, we have several events happening in the church as we live into our designation as a just peace church. Next week, there's going to be an adult education event that's looking at privilege, privilege for sale. So please check out the bulletin and all of the activities that are going on. So do you know that Bible verse that wi wisdom sometimes comes from the mouth of babes? Now, this may be a perspective as, boy, that's really obnoxious. Um, I'm going to try to stand as still as possible. Maybe this is coming from the perspective of being somewhat middle-aged. I'm going to just... There are times that for everybody that it is just hard to feel like you can spiritually connect. You get dry spells. And there can be a temptation when you're kind of in a spiritual dry spell to withdraw. But it's during those times when it can be most important to remain faithful to your spiritual practices, whatever they are. So as we begin this time of worship, I invite you to reach out. I invite you, if you feel like it, to close your eyes and just take a deep cleansing breath. God's spirit always exists. God's spirit restores your mind, 
your body, and your spirit. May you experience God's presence in some way here this morning. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is part of a story that we find within that Bible that we talk about so much. It's a moment of transfiguration when Jesus and several of his disciples find themselves on the mountainside and caught up in a holy moment. What's important for us to consider is how our lives mirror the stories that are told in our biblical account. Would you stand as you're able and join me in singing hymn number 182, We Have Come at Christ's Own Bidding. be seated. In spite of our best efforts to live faithfully, we fall short of what God intends for us. Because God has already promised to be merciful, we dare to tell the truth about our lives. In humility and trust, let us confess our sin. God of grace, for our failure to love others as you have loved us, forgive us. For wasting your gifts and hoarding our goods, forgive us. For losing heart and abandoning hope, forgive us. For all the ways we turn from you, forgive us. Let us continue our prayers now in a moment of silent reflection. Grace flows like a river. Mercy like a never-ending stream, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Amen. Please rise as you are able.
we gather in the warmth of Christian fellowship on this day. It is good to be here together. Would you take a moment now and greet all those gathered here? It's good to see all of you up here on a very cold and snowy morning, but thanks for coming. I want to tell you uh, something today that, that didn't start out very happy, but it's getting better. Uh, there's a very special person here at Colonial Church named Jan Parkinson, and last week he fell down and hurt his head really bad, so they had to take him to the hospital, and he's still there. But the good news is that he should be coming home this week. And in case you forgot what he looked like, there's Mr. Parkinson and his wife, Jane. And you know all these little signs that hang up in the hallway? Jan made those. And the big mobile that hangs in the stairway, that's Jan's work too. You've seen him all around the church taking pictures, and maybe you remember last spring when we had the uh, ice cream and root beer floats. That was Jan Parkinson's idea several years ago. And he's done just about every job there is in the church. <laughs> but more importantly, he's been a good friend to me and to everybody in the church too, because Jan's always somebody we could talk to, somebody who always had a funny story. So I was thinking, what would cheer him up? And then I thought, it's Valentine's Day. So, well, Valentine's Day coming up this week. So I thought we would send him a card from the Children's Conversation Group. Okay? And it says it's not the size of this valentine that makes it so awesome. And we'll look inside. And it says, it's the person who's holding it. Happy Valentine's Day and get well soon. And I'm hoping that you all will sign it with me because it's so big. Our signatures, the people that have, look a little small. So... I'm going to have the card up here, and what I'd like you to do is everyone come up. I have a couple markers, and sign your name, and after you do that, I've got some little cherry hearts here for you. Is this a bribe? No. <laughs> okay. Now, there's always a risk with markers. Who wants to be first? Two people at the same time can sign. And there's another marker. All right. Okay, thanks, Joey. Who's next? All right. Oh boy, we're gonna fill up this card, aren't we? Okay. 
And, okay. Wait. And that includes the adults here who sit in the children's conversation too. It's filling up fast. Okay, and we, there you go. Who hasn't signed? You take your, did you get a heart too? Okay, anybody else? It's okay, yeah, you can sign upside down or sideways. He'll read it. Great, and I'm hoping this will make him feel a lot better. It would I know I'd feel better if I got a card that big. And it's a Hallmark card too, so. <laughs> I was thinking I might make him one, but I said, no, he won't. Well, so. Okay, well, let's bow our heads and uh, say a little prayer here, and then we can go off to Sunday school. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and say the prayer. Uh, dear Lord, help our friend Jan to get well and come home soon from the hospital. Um, help all our friends to feel good and uh, have a fun Valentine's Day this week. We'll see you later. Amen. Yes, amen. <laughs>
Every scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for showing mistakes, for correcting, and for training character, so that the person who belongs to God can be equipped to do everything that is good. This was the handwritten inscription on the Bible that I got when I was in third grade. It was inscribed on every single one of those Bibles. I don't do that. But that was a really common practice. And I remember the first time that it hit me, and I began to wonder a little bit that if the person who wrote this particular letter that that passage comes from, it was addressed to a young pastor named Timothy, if he knew that the letter that he was writing would one day be considered scripture. Probably not. Last week, I got together with a few of our high schoolers, and what we're doing is about once a month, we get together down at McDonald's um, late, it's, well, 8 o'clock, and we have snacks, and we've been talking about various things. And one of the subjects that we've been talking about lately is spiritual practices. And uh, one month, we did meditation, and we practiced like, each day trying to meditate a little bit and then kind of sharing what that's like. And this last week we talked about the practice of reading scripture. And so much has changed in the last 15 years. 15 years ago, I used to do this thing when I go to like, you know, youth gatherings, regional youth events. There was a class that I was asked to teach called um, Biblical Self-Defense. And I did that at colleges too. And it, it was because there were people who were kind of wielding the Bible like it was a weapon. And they were using it to, to there were clobber verses that they would pull out of, the, out of the scriptures to prove people that they were wrong and that they needed to agree with whatever dogmatic interpretation of scripture they had. And this class, it packed them in for a while, but things changed. Because if you're going to do a class on biblical self-defense, that makes a huge assumption. It makes the assumption that people think that, first of all, that the Bible is the authority, that they care. What was once given, which was once a given, isn't any longer. The authority of the Bible went from a book that we were supposed to, when I grew up, I, the Bible was something that we were supposed to study and revere. And it went to a new generation who is asking, why? Why do these ancient writings matter? And so I listened as these wonderful young people told me their different takes on the Bible. One of them asked the question, they were unsure why one religion's text why their holy text was more important than any other. One of them thought that the Bible was important, but there was a sense that it had wisdom contained in it, which had been traditionally important to people, but it wasn't really all that necessarily important to that particular person. One of them had been really involved in youth Bible study. They got together with friends when they were in middle school. And honestly, they had felt pretty beat up by the Bible. And they were really just kind of done with the Bible at this particular point. I kind of listened to it. I, I will be honest, I was kind of, it, was, it kind of matched to what I thought I might hear. But I will tell you this. The Reformation that began 500 years ago, I think we can officially declare it is over. The Re Reformation of Western Christianity coincided with the Enlightenment and particularly with the printing press. And the idea was that the Bible was going to be Christianity's highest authority. It was going to be our rule book for teaching, for showing mistakes, for correcting for training character so that the person who belongs to God can be equipped for it to do everything that is good. Put a Bible into people's hands and the rest would just take care of itself. This was a goal in Reformation thinking. 
The Bible was supposed to become the foundation of Christianity. It would become revered as the highest authority in Christ's church. But here we are. The assumption that the Bible is the highest source of authority is over. We've witnessed the Bible being weaponized, made to say whatever you want it to, to beat other people down. We have access to the religious texts of so many religions on your phone, at your fingertips. The Bible as a collection of writings wasn't meant to be a rule book. Not all of it, anyway. It wasn't designed to be what the Quran is to Islam, without error and perfect. It wasn't meant to be the foundation of religion. Jesus said, everybody who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise builder who built a house on bedrock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the wind blew and beat against that house. It didn't fall because it was firmly set on bedrock. But everybody who hears these words of mine and doesn't put them to, into practice will be like a fool who built a house on sand. The rain fell, the floods came, and the wind blew and beat against that house. It fell and was completely destroyed. When Jesus finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he was teaching them like somebody with authority and not like their legal experts. The Bible has been promoted to be Christianity's religious foundation, but it cannot live up to the expectations that were piled on it. That foundation was one of sand. The Bible wasn't supposed to be the foundation Four, think about this, four different and sometimes differing versions of Jesus' life were selected out of the dozens that were, writ were written. Today you can Google and read all of the Gospels. There are dozens of them. But think about it. Our Christian ancestors chose four different and sometimes differing versions because it reflects the diversity of experience that we've got. Words of God, revelations of the divine, they come in many ways. The Bible itself relates these revelations to have come to us in the form of burning bushes, dreams, voices on the wind. And for Christians, certainly the life, the teachings, and the living spirit of Jesus of Nazareth. Our foundation isn't a book. It's God. And whatever God choose, way God chooses to connect to us. And so I'm at a strange point. I have this sense of reverence for the Bible. I have free friends who tease me because I will not write in my study Bible. I just It feels wrong to write in a Bible, so I just don't do it. And it's not like I think that somebody's committing some sort of sin when they write in their Bibles. It's just a sense of reverence that I have for that book. Now, I read the Bible constantly. Now, mostly I do it on an app. But I have felt God's Spirit deeply touch me at times. And yet, I know, I know that the truth is that there have been so many expectations that have been loaded onto the Bible, and they are too great. I hear the voices of our children who are facing so much at this particular time in their lives and in our world, so many trials, so much hurt. And it's not enough just to hand them a book. The true value of living in Christ's way, this true value of what it means to be Christian, and ultimately the true value of the Bible itself 
is the power to transform lives, to help us grow beyond ourselves, to proclaim hope to anyone who is living as a slave to fear or to addiction or to any number of petty tyrants. The gospel, the good news, is only good if it leads to changed lives. Otherwise, it's just words. The ancient words, the beautiful poetry, the wisdom contained in the Bible isn't useful for just rehearsing the mighty acts of God in the past or for just mere trivia. Although I'm going to tell you, if you are become an expert in Bible trivia, you can clean up at trivia nights. <laughs> it's about figuring out the wisdom, the values for living the days that you've got. It's about learning from the mistakes of the past because the Bible records things when people went off the rails and did horrible and stupid things. They're not examples of those. They're, in fact, they're examples of bad things. But we can learn from those so that we are not condemned to make the same mistakes in every generation. And so I'm going to be honest. Over the next few weeks, I have a goal in mind. We're right now, we are a few weeks out from the series of Lent, or the season of Lent. And I'd like to encourage you during Lent to engage with the Bible for during those few weeks. To try to read the Bible every day, but do it in a way that pushes the boundaries of your spiritual imagination. Where you read what's in those pages, but then you ask the questions. You challenge the assumptions. A few number of weeks back, we were up here at Children's Conversation, and Sean Liu, Sean Liu loves to get up here and talk with me. So I, he, Sean Liu had, has had some tough questions for me recently. And I, I adore Sean. And he sat up next to me. And Sean, he's done Sunday school for many years. And he's at a point in his, on his journey right now where he's starting to ask some questions. He realizes that there's a lot more to the books of the, Bi or the Bible that he's been taught. And he's growing up. And his world is getting bigger. And he's learning about things, about different cultures and different religions. And he's learning about science. And he's got questions. And this is the reason, one of the many reasons that I just love Sean. He just asks. Sits up on his chancel steps, you know. We're gonna, it's going to be whatever the, the chancel the con conversation is going to be. And then it's going to be the conversation he's going to have with me. And... For all the reasons that older kids and adults have kind of written off the Bible, Sean hasn't. He's skeptical, but he's curious. So he asked me about the creation stories. How can these stories be right given the physics of the Big Bang and even evolution? Those are great questions. And so we sat out afterwards and we talked about those. And then he, he asked me about the story of Cain and Abel. So clearly this is a kid who's kind of just starting his read through the Bible. He asked me about the story of Cain and Abel. And if they, can, if they are the only family on the earth, then who are the other people that Cain goes to live among? Well spotted, Sean. <laughs> and so... I've offered to go down and meet with our tweens group and to have a special conversation with them whenever they like to talk about these ideas and the questions that they have, the challenges that they've got. Because ultimately, my goal is not to convince them that the Bible must be believed because God commands it and I'm telling them that. What I want to happen is for them to uncover for themselves the persistent values of hope. To learn, to, to learn from the mistakes of our ancestors and to keep growing in wisdom. 
And it's not just our kids who are skeptical. Most adults do at some point kind of give up on the Bible as an important part of their spiritual life. And they do that rather early on. But here's the truth. For thousands of years, people from every culture, place, language, have found something special in the biblical text. Yes, far too many expectations have been piled on to the Bible, but that doesn't change the truth that so many people's have, that lives have been transformed by it, too. How many people who faced oppression, how many people who were once immigrants or slaves found hope in the words of these texts? There is something in there for you. And so with it being Lent in a few weeks, I'm going to invite you to be part of our spring cleaning, our dusting off. I know it's not spring yet. It's, it's coming. But it's to be part of a short Bible devotional that we do as a congregation each day. And so what I'd love to have you do is, if, you, if you're interested in taking part, I've put the word devotional by your name in the pew pad today. Because more than just read a few lines of text, and you can do that. We've got it set up so each day you'd receive an email with a reading and a very short reflection, but also a way on social media for you to share any insights that you have, any experiences that you have or questions or concerns that, you're, that you have, but to share that through social media. Because that is exactly how the Bible can transform lives, when we take it seriously. When we go deeper, not because we have to, but because we choose to, there is power in our shared story. Maybe not with the elevated expectations that got piled onto it over the last 500 years, but with the potential demonstrated over the centuries to transform lives. And this is the experiment that I invite you to. So do make a note in that pew pad today or in the days to come to take your part in dusting off the Bible for Lent. May that story continue to have power to touch your spirit. Amen. When I was a kid, we had a hymn sing at church once, and I remember selecting our hymn now. as This was my favorite when I was a kid. I love to tell the story. Let's sing it together now. Please rise.
Jesus endless love. I love to tell the story for those who know it best. See hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. And when I sing seated. We have a story to tell as the congregation of Colonial Church, a story about standing on the side of justice, a story about being a people on a journey towards a more fully fulfilling faith. The story that we tell is part of how we practice generosity, not only in our congregation, but in our community and in our world. I invite you now to give generously to the work of this church. Will our ushers come to receive our gifts? Please rise as you are able.
please join me as we pray a blessing for the offering. Oh God, bless these gifts that we may have given as expressions of our love for you and our neighbors. May they guide us to your reign of peace and love. Amen. Please be seated. All right, we're just gonna have to deal with that, that, that static. I don't know what that's all about, but there you go. I, I stand really still, it seems to like that. So one of the ways we talk about how lives are transformed and that the core of Christianity, the core of, our, of, of the foundation is transformed lives and static. There was a person I was speaking to this last week, somebody that we've been praying for, who was talking about the transformative power of knowing that, you've be, that you're being prayed for and what that means to, means to a person when you feel yourself being held in the spiritual act of prayer. Each week, the people in this community, we take the prayers that from our community, we offer them up to God together, and that those people are prayed for throughout the week. And so, after each one of our prayers today, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and can you lift it up with me, saying, hear our prayer. This past Monday, we celebrated the life and the resurrection of our diva, Kathy Huey. The choir had over 70 people, and I've never heard a sound like that in this, in this room before. It was incredible. Today we give, we, we th ask God's presence to be with Marvin and all who grieve Kathy. Lord, in your mercy. And as, as Bob was saying too, last Sunday, right after worship, Jan Parkinson was going to his grandson's basketball game and he suffered a head injury. He fell and got a big gash on his he head and he is healing well. Now he got a secondary infection after that and they've been treating that infection with antibiotics this week. And most importantly, his physicians are trying to work to find out how to regulate his blood pressure from dropping, which is, was the call, cause of the fall in the first place. And so they're, they're working on all of these things. And one of the complications is, is that the drugs that they're using are interfering with his Parkinson's medication. And so he can't move very much right now, and he's extremely frustrated. So is he's, gonna, he's gonna have a few weeks of rehab coming up, and so we need to surround him with the prayers because he is frustrated right now. He is healing, but he's frustrated, and for him to feel God's love in our prayers today. Lord, in your mercy. We also received word this morning that Mark Ball, who is the longtime music director at Village Church and the current music director at Southminster Press, our, our neighbors right over here, he died yesterday from a heart attack and it has sent huge waves through the community. His daughter is 13 years old, goes to school here in the community, and so we want to hold their, entire, their family in our prayers this morning as that, as that news affects the heart of so many. Lord, in your mercy. Lisa Ray Turnbull went down after the news that her, fa her father, Dave, had um, contracted pneumonia, and her dad is 92 years old and generally pretty healthy, but the news of this pneumonia was pretty dire, so she flew down, she reported back, the good news is that he is healing and actually went home on Friday. And so she is on her way home shortly too, but we want to thank God for the healing that her dad has received and pray that it continues. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Diane Starkey asks for prayers for her master gardener friend, Ann, who's gonna be having surgery this next week at KU Med Center for colon, for colon cancer. And so we pray that God's healing light be with her and her medical team as they work. Lord, in your mercy. And Sarah Hedren is not here with us. She is out of the, out of the ice. She's doing something interesting this weekend, and she asks for prayers from, from her church family for this. Recently, she has received treatment for, she has suffered from debilitating migraines for decades. And recently, she has received treatment that she, the way that she describes it has just breathed new life back into her. And so she, along with dozens of others, are off to Washington, D.C. right now to speak with legislators about funding and support for those who suffer as she has. And as she travels over these next few days, we ask for God's spirit to bless her as she extends the influence of healing that she has received. Lord, in your mercy. Where is God connecting with you? Or has the presence of God, God felt somewhat distant from you lately? Take a moment now to reach out in silent prayer.
Let's pray together. In our community's continuing prayers, we continue to keep all people who are living and serving in the middle of war in our prayer. And we ask for the Holy Spirit to keep them safe and help all of us find a path to peace. And for caregivers and for those living with dementia, may they receive the respect and the love that they deserve. And we pray for God to guide this nation's ideals of freedom and justice for all people in these turbulent times. And we pray for all people who are living in the shadow of depression or mental illness, and we ask for God's light of hope to shine. And for those immigrants and refugees who are far from the land they knew, we ask for safety and compassion to come from Christ Church. And for those loved ones in our lives who are with cancer and other ongoing life-threatening conditions, we pray for Kelly Giambri, Sean Bolter, Karen Fogelsong, Kathy Hellwedge, Caleb Ball, Andrew Wood, Nathan Green, Clive Griffiths, William Scare, Cindy Russell, and Lee Frommelt. And today also we add Bob Kimbrough, a friend of Jerry and Joan Gilson, who is a young father of five as he has a new diagnosis of cancer. We pray for God's strength to flow from our prayers to them. Sometimes it's enough just to simply get through the day, to have the daily bread that you need. Let's pray for what is sufficient for this day right now, as we pray as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is number 407 in our hymnal, How Firm a Foundation. Will you stand as you're able and join in song?
time has come to look through that old story with new eyes. I'm just going to shut that off. There are new blessings and enlightenment as we remove all that has been piled on top of the expect expectations for the Bible. I invite you now to dust it off, to look with fresh eyes, to seek to be transformed by what you might find. You may find yourself changed in ways that you didn't expect. And as we head into the days ahead, we go together in our mission to change the world, and that starts by changing ourselves. We now covenant with one another to continue to go to do that, to extend the influence of Christ to all the places. And if you're not at a point in your life where you feel like you can make the vows that we make,